came to me with a long Methodist tradition of uh, laity having a voice in the church. We're going to invite Ken to stand up for it. And you can all have a seat back there while I'm chattering on for a moment, giving Ken a chance to prepare himself. But, uh, you know, we are blessed here in this church to have uh, four lay speakers who are certified for lay speaking. Lisa and David are here this Sunday morning. Melissa was here earlier. And Ken is going to bring the message today. I get to hear two very different sermons, I think, this Sunday morning. Oh, I'm Melissa sure you will. Have to share. But again, Methodist, Methodist Church, we try to encourage all of our laity to be thinking, studying, lifting up, as, as uh, we are told, every Christian has a message to give. We'll hear Ken this Sunday morning. Thank you, Ken. Well, Melissa and I sat down Wednesday morning, and if many of you don't know that the church suggests a, lit a lectionary with verses and stuff that, to go by each Sunday, and we looked at Lamentations, and Neither one of us thought it was a very uplifting verse or whatever. So neither one of us thought what we were going to do. So I listened to her sermon this morning, and she went a whole way different than I did. So two different sermons. The scriptures that we read this morning also had additional ones to them. Lamentations 1, 1 through 6, and Psalm 137. Now Psalm 137 we've had this morning by the Babylonian rivers. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit this morning about uh, Lamentations 1, 1 through 6. If you want to follow along with me, it's on page 933 in your Bible. And I'm not going to use your Bible's version, so you might want to follow along and see where I goof up. But this is Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1 through 6, interpreted by me for use on this day. And I'm going to change some of the names to make it more appropriate. The United States of America's streets once flowed with people unafraid to use God's name. They're now silent. They're like a widow broken with grief. We all sit alone in our mourning. We once royalty among the nations, are now despised by many. Check verse 2. We cry about our afflictions. Bitter tears stain our faces. Among our allies, none will really help us. All our friends are against us. Why is the United States of America being held captive? Because all the wrong we have done to others feigning help while all along the time really we were using to control them. Our help always has strings attached. There is no rest, for those we have accused and spoke out against have turned against us viciously. The pathways to the United States of America no longer are filled with people coming for our religious freedom. Christ is no longer proclaimed in public anymore. All our church's festivals are no longer the community's center of attention. We Christians grieve. The innocents are corrupted and torn away from God. And angrily we cry. Our enemies grow in numbers and prosper. For the Lord is punishing us for all our wrong decisions and doings. The children are being indoctrinated with the devilish ideas and are becoming slaves to his very ways. All the beauty and majesty of the United States of America are gone. All our politicians are like starving deer that search aimlessly for green pastures. Helpless people too weak-minded to keep on running from our wrong decisions. Now, America was founded on the freedom of religion, not the freedom from religion, as some would like to think. There's no governmental decree of separation of church and state. That was from a letter that Thomas Jefferson sent, and it was never through the United States government. Because the founders of our great nation were very much into God. 
but they'd also felt the heaviness and the corruption that government could apply to their very religion. Our founders believed in God. They believed in the God-given right to free will. And free will, God-given. But it's also the right not to choose God. The United States of America started as a refuge from political and religious persecution. Everyone helped everyone else. And God was heard about the streets of our nation, wherever you went. Their very survival depended upon their neighbors. And there was much thanksgiving to God for the thrill to become one of his children. Yes, our country, the United States of America, has began to collapse upon itself. Forces of our enemies have battled us on distant lands, and we've rallied around the flag and gone to those lands and fought our battles. But that's not what's causing our collapse. Our collapse is coming from right within our borders that we've been help helping to protect all this time. Politicians and citizenry have become more and more at war with each other. We were the land of golden opportunity, but I fear that we're becoming the land of criminal profitability. Our streets were never really paved with gold, and we were never really paradise, but it was a lot better than what it is now. The Lord is not spoken of openly in our streets anymore, in respect for the Father, and the Son and the Holy Spirit have eroded in our culture to almost where it's not there. We're in danger, we Christians here, of becoming the minority if we're not there already. Well, how could the God who is so loving and so kind have allowed this to happen? We have to look back in history. Israelites, God's chosen people, were overran again and again and again in all of the, through their history. They were captured and they were repeatedly made slaves of several different cultures and nations. And God let that happen. We sang this morning Psalm 137 by the Babylonian River. Israel, slaves again in a foreign land. They pause by a river to rest and they weep. But they don't weep because of their enslavement. Or when they think about who has enslaved them and what's going on, they start rallying around their patriotism and their hatred begins to manifest itself. No, they were not weeping because they're captives. They're weeping because they've lost what they once had. Once they, they've lost what they once had with God. To them, they seemed that God had abandoned them. Well, we here cry about God abandoning us, and we ask why. We seek answers to this question, and we seem to come up empty. No solutions. If God is so loving and forgiving, how can he let this happen again and again and again? And to answer that, he gave me the words of my own parents. God has a sense of humor. And I wrote it out big. I don't know if you can read this. But it says, How many times have I told you not to do it? <laughs> so it's your own kids, haven't you? I have. Can you see God saying that to his people? To us? How many times have I told you not to? God's been doing that and saying that since the beginning of time. Since the very first paradise. And what are the things we're not supposed to do? Well, God even went so far as to once write it down on stone so you couldn't change it. He gave it to Moses and he gave it to us.
And have we followed his word, written in stone? More so than any parent, God cringes each time we do wrong. Now believe me, he rejoices each time we get it right. But how many times do we have to be told to do it right? He's been letting this happen to us again and again. And he get, brought this back to me again, words from my parents. And I wrote this down for you too. You made your bed, now lie in it. Never used to know what that meant. I sure do now. It's not God abandoning us. It's we abandoning God. And we're the ones who are doing it to ourselves. He's just using, as a modern term called here, tough love. Never really abandons us. Never really leaves our side. But he's sure trying to teach us his way. Choose wrong, and there's consequences. By our own choosing, not God's, we have only ourselves to blame for what's wrong. And that's the first lesson I want to tell, talk to you about today. Free will is ours. We can choose right or wrong. And the first lesson for today is choose wisely, God's child. And that's from Lamentations. That's what I got from Lamentations. Choose wisely. Now from 2 Timothy, I got our second lesson for today. It's from Paul, who is a missionary for Jesus Christ, and it's to Timothy. And it's all about thanksgiving for Timothy and a reminder to Timothy to, quote, stir the flames that are still within you. Strength and boldness that are within you because of the Holy Spirit. Do not be afraid of other people. Be wise and strong and loving and enjoy life with them. With the Holy Spirit, never will you be afraid to tell others of Jesus Christ. Oh, I sure found my new verse, favorite verse. Talk about public speaking. With the Holy Spirit, never be afraid to tell others of Jesus Christ. Verse 14 goes, guard well the God-given gift. That ability that lies within you, shown to you by the Holy Spirit. Yep, 2 Timothy chapter 1 was made just for public speakers, lay speakers, people of music. Never be afraid. As long as you're with the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that can happen to you. And because of 2 Timothy, that's the second lesson of the day. Using the Holy Spirit that is already within you, never be afraid to talk about Jesus Christ. So you have lesson one, choose wisely. And lesson two, don't be afraid. Now I have a third lesson today, and that one's going to come from Luke. And it, it strikes me that the disciples have been following Christ along, all along, and all of a sudden they say, we need more faith. How do we get it? Show us the way. And Jesus answers them about faith the size of a mustard seed and being able to do an enormous feat. And then he continues to tell them about serving without being thanked and to do what they were been told to do without looking for praise. That sounds like an answer they were looking for. These men are asking their leader their friend, their spiritual advisor to show them the way to become more faithful. And he tells them to quit whining and do what he tells them. I found in the Bible that Jesus almost never gives a direct answer to the question you ask. 
He gives you the answer that you need, whether you like it or not. Not, not the answer that you want. And isn't that what a true friend does? A true friend's not a yes man. A true friend is someone who will tell you just like it is. Tell you what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. So here's the Ken Taylor version of Luke. The disciples are scared that they don't have enough and don't know enough and aren't ready to do what Christ is requesting of them. We're all the same way. I'm always scared and I'm, that I'm not good enough. I don't have enough knowledge of the scriptures or maybe I'm not likable enough to be a lay speaker. Maybe even the lay leader. And I'm sure I don't have enough in me to do the job that Jesus really wants me to be. Pastor Norm gets up here every Sunday and he makes it look so easy. You gotta remember that he has years of experience and tons of knowledge. How can I even begin to think and do what he does and make it all worthwhile? So I pray every time that I need to get up here and I say, Hey Jesus, how about a little help here? Help me out. Give me that little boost in faith so I can really do a bang up job. And I drive to work every week, every day, nothing seems to come. And then when I least expect it, he hits me over the top of the head and it says, here, this is what you're going to do. And it starts to make sense. So this is what Jesus answered me about the mustard seed and the whining disciples. But first I'm going to ask you a few questions. I want a response. First question is this, do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Yes. yes. Good answer. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son? Yes. yes. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, our Comforter? Yes. And do you believe that Christ died and was raised from the dead just for our salvation? Yes. Then my friends, you have faith. You have faith in Christ as our leader, our teacher, our brother, and our friend. And what he's telling us in Luke is that faith is sufficient. He said that a faith the size of a mustard seed, and if you don't know how big a mustard seed is, it's not very big at all, about the size of a period. He says you can move a tree from there to there with no problem whatsoever. Now, he doesn't tell them if they've got that faith or more. But I believe what he's telling them is they've got faith. And that's all it takes. He's saying that you have enough faith for what I'm telling you to do. And you have to believe that. Because Christ won't tell you to do something unless he's already given you that faith in the first place. He's not telling me to pull up a tree and move it across town and throw it in the water and plant it again just by my faith. No, he's not telling me to do that. He's telling me to come up here and speak with you and give you some lessons and praise him for that he's given me enough faith. But then he goes on to talk to the disciples some more. And when he says, when you finish your task, the completion of that task, doing it, is in its own reward. You don't need the pat on the back. You don't need people saying thank you. Doing it well is a sufficient reward. So just do it. As Melissa had talked before, you just plod along and do what you're told. Have your faith, and that's more than enough reward. So lesson number three today is just do it. You have more than enough faith to stop questioning yourself. 
You don't need the celebratory parties and you don't need statues made for you because I came up here and did a really good job today. No, just do the best you can with the ability that God gave you. Just do it. So that's the third lesson today. So we've had three lessons. Number one, choose wisely, child of God. Your choices have consequences. Number two is don't be afraid. With God and the Holy Spirit within you and beside you, you can accomplish anything. And number three is don't worry about it. Just do it. God won't tell you to do anything that you aren't capable of. Now, I want to bring God back into the streets of my nation. I really want to bring God, bring God back into the streets of party. I want to make it so that no one is afraid to speak Christ's name walking down the street for fear that somebody might think bad of it. So how do I personally, me, accomplish this? My three lessons today. Don't be afraid. And just do it. I've already chose wisely because I've chosen God's side of it. With Christ and God and the Holy Spirit, all three in one, beside me and in me, there isn't anybody who can stop me. Today is worldwide communion. We have Christians all over the world in communion today. So if I want to bring God back into the streets of my nation, I don't want to stop there. I want worldwide peace. And I, myself, can do that. God's given me the ability. And he's given you the ability. Just do it with my three lessons today. First of all, choose wisely. Second, don't be afraid. And third, just do it. If every single Christian who took communion today would really believe that all their sins are forgiven and that big burden is taken off their back and they're not starting life over, they're just starting life anew. If all those Christians would make those three lessons, those three choices, just choose correctly. Don't be afraid. Christ is with you. And just do it. And you don't need to do it across town, across the country, across the nation, or the world. You just need to do it with the person who is right beside you. If everybody brought peace to their neighbor, worldwide peace can't be stopped. So worldwide peace begins with me, myself, and I. It's not left for someone else to do. It's for me. And it's for you. And with that, in Jesus Christ's name, I pray this will happen. Thank you again. We prepare for time of communion.